good to be out here today uh, where we can learn the word and fellowship and perhaps uh, honor God with our worship to Him as we give Him devotion to our thoughts, our thoughts to Him and our devotion to His His calls for uh, being exalted through Christ our Lord. And so it's good to be out here and able to do that. I entitled this lesson, and it's a little bit of a continuation of Romans 1 and verse 17, when we started talking about the righteousness of God, our series on the essence of God and the attributes of God has this in it. And I thought it would be appropriate to make it a part of that. As we go through the book of Romans, we're going to move right along. But there will be times when there will be a few things that I think need special emphasis, especially when it's the theme of this book, the righteousness of God. Obviously also that which is found in Christ our Lord in verse 16 and 17 as being revealed from heaven, that is through Christ. So I entitled this lesson, The Righteousness of God Revealed. The Righteousness of God Revealed. And you have no questions today. So you can write down whatever questions you want to ask yourself or me. And um, just wait till after the message to ask it, please, so I can get through it. The righteousness of God revealed, seen in Romans chapter 1. Paul said in verse 11, I long to see you that I may impart unto you a spiritual gift or some spiritual gift. No particular spiritual gift, the definite article is not used here, that I may impart it unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That, you know what that means. You get grounded in the faith. You're not moved back from the basics of the faith. I've got a note on my desk, uh, just a little series that would probably, I need to notch in there somewhere. Uh, things that we ought to know as Christians, things you ought to know as a Christian. Because I never assume that we all have all that basic knowledge. Things that we ought to know as a Christian. Things that, and it comes from the Bible, not from religion or tradition or the Baptist denomination. For I long to see that I may impart a new spiritual gift, some spiritual gift to the end, for the result to be that you be established. <clears throat> that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith so the context of that gift is going to have something to do with the faith the mu mutual faith of both you and me we know what Paul's faith was in who it was in now I would not have you to be ignorant brethren a common phrase of the apostle Paul knowledge was important I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come to you, I determined to come to you, but I was prevented thus far that I might have some fruit. Again, goes back to like the spiritual gift and the mutual faith of verses 11 and 12, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. Even as among other Gentiles. Now, he was speaking to Jewish people who were saved and Gentile people who were saved, but it was basically known to be a Gentile nation. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, that is those who don't have uh, the higher form of communication as the Greeks would, or those who spoke the Koine Greek and those who spoke uh, what they call the civilized languages, both to the wise and to the unwise. I'm a debtor to everyone, regardless of economic or uh, racial uh, culture differences it makes no difference. I am a debtor to both. So much is in me that I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He sensed that he wanted that. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now I want us to notice something. Now you may not have it in your Bible that you've done that, but I just want to bring something out to you. The book of Romans is a book of explanations. It's not a, just a treatise on the justice and righteousness of God and the singularity of the gospel found only in Christ, because it is. 
but it is also a book of explanations. If you look at verse 9, now I, I have mine highlighted. You might not have a highlighter now, but you might have a, you might not want to use a pen or pencil, might not even want to mark in your Bible. But for me, I've got mine marked. Uh, four, 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 and then I'll turn the page, and guess what? Four, 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 and you could just go on and on. And the word four, or the word four, as you, some of you know that, in the Greek is gar. It uh, looks like gar. That's not a P. That's an R in Greek. And X, it explains. I think there's an I. A e X P L A I. All right, we'll get that in a minute. It explains. That's what it does. It's called an explanatory gar, and it means that he's going to give an explanation of what he's been talking about. And so Paul is constantly explaining himself. An explainer of the Bible is what we call an expositor. Expositors explain. They just don't try to make outlines that are, you know, because I've been taught, and some of you have as well, how to do an outline. Capital, you know, Roman number one, two, three, whatever, and then A, this, B, this, C, this, and under A, B, and C, then you've got one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then on the one, two, three, you've got little A, little B, little C, whatever, till if you want to look at how not, John Phillips, I love John Phillips, but he can have a whole book, and half the book is the outline. It doesn't explain anything, but it breaks down. It, you'd be amazed at how many pages and pages and pages of outline before you even get to the first explanation. That's just a bit much for me. It's a little bit laborious, but he did a lot of work doing that. So God bless him for that. He's with the Lord now, but explaining the Scriptures is what we're supposed to do. So let me explain. <laughs> Well, first, let's pray. Father, we ask for your blessing today, for your guidance. We ask that you give us understanding of things that are wonderful, to give us a sense of um, your purpose uh, in Paul writing this this book. Uh, give us a sense of your purpose and uh, how it affects us and how we are to take it, how uh, you use it to strengthen our faith as you have those for the last 2,000 years. And so we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for everyone that's come out today. We pray that uh, we know that your word will not return into you void. It will accomplish what you send it forth to do. Help me to get it out today, Father, in a way that honors you and help us all uh, to, to worship and honor you uh, through what we learn. In Christ's name, amen. First thing I want us to know as we get further down here, Paul says, so much is in me, verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at room also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power, the dynamite of God unto salvation. The dynamite is in that message, the word of God alone. Christ is the written word. He's the living word. Let's not forget that too. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it is the righteousness that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the, the message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the gospel of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is also the underlying foundational assumption of the deity of Jesus Christ. Because it means nothing if you are dead and you are buried. But showing his deity, he was raised from the dead. He satisfied the just demands of a holy God upon uh, for sin, that he paid, made the payment in full. He didn't pay for part of your sins. Jesus Christ did not pay for your sins until you, up to your salvation, and then it's up to you to stay good so that you get to heaven. He paid for all of your sins for all time. We have to understand the omniscience of God. He always knew all the sins of the entire world. Never was a time that he did not know that. He never 
God has never had to acquire knowledge. He's never been taken by surprise. He's always had all knowledge. And he's had all power to create. And he knows that when he creates that it's not going to be multiple gods. That it's going to be less than. That's why Jesus was not created. He was not less than. He is God in the flesh. He is God the second person. He's the Son of God by title, not just a title. It's not a physical uh, association that we make it as a physical association. It's a title. Never was a time when Jesus is as old, Jesus is as, old as the Father as far as that's concerned. The second person of the Godhead is the one who came down and blew the nostrils into the clay of Adam and created a Nefesh Kaya, a living soul. He's the one that did that. He was the one that walked in the garden with them. The Father no man hath seen. No man has seen the Father, and we won't see Him until all sin is gone and there's a new heaven and a new earth, and that He will come down ascending out of the heaven with the heavenly city Jerusalem and put it planted upon the new earth at the end of time, which you've got in your little charts right there. Some of you may have now. That's Wednesday night, more Wednesday night stuff. But for in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. The righteousness of God is not a sub, something that is kept behind cathedral doors. It is not something kept behind a monastery. It's not something kept behind uh, the walls of a library in Alexandria, Egypt. Or in a basement somewhere. It is all out there for the world to see. It's called the cross. The cross shows us just how much God hates sin. And it also shows us just how much God loves mankind. And we need to see both sides of that. In that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So you share the gospel with your friends. People you don't know sometimes. And they may take that and the God's Spirit will then give them cognizance in their thinking. Is this real? Is this something that I need? Their conscience, their self-consciousness will tell them yes. Their sin nature in them will tell them no. And they have to decide which Lord that they are going to continue with going forward. Many people go forward with the sin nature. It's, it remains their Lord, though they may be religious. But for the person who need, who really senses that they need salvation, they say, I'm going to put all my eggs in the gospel basket. And I'm putting them all, everything. As Jerry Jones from the, Yank, uh, from the Cowboys once said here this past year when they wanted to know if he had finished his draft picks like he wanted, was he going to stick with Dak and these other players that are big-time players of the team? He said, we're all in. We're all in. And that was humorous to me. For you, you, I played football and officiated football in high school for years. And when I hear somebody who's a big shot worth billions of dollars and he says something, we're all in. We're not going to change a thing. Everything. And when it comes to the salvation, I don't, I'm not like John Wayne. I, I want to get uh, favors from the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Catholics and the Protestants and, and, and the rabbis because that's what John Wayne said. He wanted to say, I want to make sure I had a little piece of all of it so I make sure I got in on the man upstairs good side. How foolish. All you need is Jesus Christ. Be all in on Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as are written, the just shall live by faith. We'll pick up with verse 18 through 20 next lesson, but I want to say this. All moral issues, that is those thoughts and actions pertaining to virtue, honesty, character, and behavior, which measures right from wrong, they must find the righteous standard of God to find their bearing. Not the Supreme Court, not some district attorney, not some group here or there, not some cultural appropriation manner. We find our moral foundation in God's righteousness. When we go off course in life, and we all do, we're born off course, but when we go off course in life, we only have to turn to the Word of God to find our way back. That's where Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You keep on putting away and you'll say, You know what? I ought not be thinking that way. 
I'm being selfish. <laughs> I'm being hurtful. Ought not be that way. And the Word of God pulls us back. Our conscience forgets things. And when it does, we don't have a foundation for our thinking. Your thinking has to have a library to draw its thoughts from, whether it's how you're raised or whatever. And if you're raised <laughs> wrong, the Bible helps raise you back right. Or religion raised you wrong. It, the Bible will help raise you back right. We only have to turn to the Word of God to find our way back. After all, true moral absolutes, they do come from God. He is our North Star. Man has his ethics and it's human good, but these are not righteousness in themselves. <coughs> First course that I took when I was in Bible college as a freshman was Christian ethics. I didn't know whether those terms were supposed to be put together or not. <laughs> There's humor to that if you just think about it after church. <laughs> that ethical means you, you know, you're going to do the right thing. They, they were trying to prevent us from having the sense that you know, or thinking that they're going to allow cheating in college. They weren't going to allow cheating, that type of stuff, you know. You're going to do your work, and if you said you did that work, you didn't plagiarize it. You're, uh, back then, they didn't have computers, so, you know, they were relying on you being honest when you went to the library that you actually got that. Uh, we didn't have the ways that you could do that then. You had to do your own work, and you had to use typewriters. We didn't even, we didn't even have, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it? Word processors. That was before the uh, um, uh, compact presarios and before all the other stuff that came before that. But anyway, our absolutes have to come from God. And God has, his, uh, has the truth. Man has his ethics, his nature, his human good, but they're not righteousness in themselves. If we want to write our ship when it had gone off course, God is there to lead the way if we want that. Or if we want to get on course, that is to get saved and know we're going to heaven, then we need to get on God's ship, His ark as it were. Christ is our ark. People through human, human history have established their own codes of right and wrong. You know that if you've ever studied world history, people through human history, they've established their own codes of right and wrong. When they establish the rule the rules that their society is going to live by. They establish the rules of governance based on the rule makers' own standards of right and wrong. Somebody has said that was wrong. Somebody has said this is what we're supposed to do. And it may have no foundation at all in the Bible. There's places all over the world that are like that. The North Korean leadership, they have their own rules of what they say is right. And that is that the, the president, the leader, the prime minister, whether they want to call the nut job, rocket man, I don't care. Is a is a dictator, okay? That's what he is. He's a dictator. Well, he and the, and his high staff they write the rules for what is right, and what is wrong. It was based upon, you know, dynasties before him. Other countries have done the same thing. Our standards. <coughs> And our Bill of Rights and our Constitution is based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic of man being made in the image of God and to be respected and to be protected and evil to be punished and things like that. And it goes on and on. That's based in Scripture. In our present society, Americans hide behind the amoralist mindset that everybody's doing it so it must be okay. The mantra is that everybody's doing it or, as you hear recently, we need to be on the right side of history. In other words, we need to use cultural appropriation to make sure that everybody feels the same way as the small select group feels. I have noticed that they are very smug about their life choices and they really do not care about what God thinks about those choices as per the Word of God, the Bible. Being on the right side of God is passe. It's old-fashioned. It's out of date. Even Cain thought his mother, Adam and Eve, were out of date. That they were out of touch with the new generation.
living in our society with its attitude of moral relevance, that is what's right for you is for you, but perhaps not for me, has led to many errors. For some unbelievers, they question not just the standards of God, but His very existence. And it's becoming more and more so around the world. People are more and more, as we were talking, becoming more secular in their mindset and more at least agnostic, if not atheistic, in their view of divinity. People are more and more questioning the standard of God. Well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the revealed righteousness of God. He is the standard bearer of God. But people are thinking, why concern ourselves with the standards of God if we've come to believe that God is not real? That's the thinking among many people. I have this book. Some of you have read it. it is, it's entitled, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It takes more faith to be an atheist. It takes more faith to believe in evolutionary philosophy than it does in scientific creation. So regarding the heart of Christianity, Oswald Chambers of 1874 to 1917, a Scottish theologian and preacher, said once regarding the believer who rather than worships and serves God from a pure spirit, serves God only from a rational perspective. Quote, a person's own idea of God and His attributes may actually be used to justify and rationalize His de deliberate neglect of His duty. A person's own idea of God and, their, and, and of God's I attributes, because if people have a twisted view of the attributes and the essence of God, they have a twisted view. And as I've said many times, everybody has their own theology, their own scientific reasoning about what they think God is and what they think God is like. Everyone has that. Well, I want to tell you, if you just study the Gospels in particular, Jesus is the face of God. He is the full pleroma, the fullness, the Greek there is. He's everything that God is in flesh. So study Jesus Christ and you're studying the Father. Jesus says, you've seen me. You have seen the Father. You've seen the Father get mad when He turned over the money changers' t uh, tables in the temple. You've seen the Father dog the Pharisees and scribes and call them nothing but white-throated sepulchers and their, they, their words smelt like that of someone who'd been dead for days. You've seen Him tell those who were going to stone the woman caught in the act of adultery, those who are among you who are without sin, Go ahead and throw the first stone. And it was the wisest of those who left first, and then the more ignorant ones were the last ones leave because they're still thinking, I don't know whether I've got sin or not. The wiser ones, at least, even though unbelievers that were going to stone this woman, I have yet to figure out why they didn't drag the man's rear end out there to stone him. I don't know why he was getting the pass. Probably one of the Pharisees. One of the good old boys, probably. I don't know. Or his son. I don't know. But this woman, she was going to get the daylight, she was going to get killed. I don't know why they weren't going to kill him. This, this Stone Age thinking is the same thing that still goes on in Afghanistan. You don't hear them throwing acid in the face of a man. You don't hear them taking out and beating boys. They abuse boys because a lot of them are homosexuals. But you don't see a lot of this among uh, the, the, the average man. You know, All you got to do to be a big shot in Afghanistan is to own a cane. So you can cane people. And he, get you a beard and a cane and a towel head and you're good to go. But the women are just chattel. Property. There's no place on the planet where women are more respected than in the United States of America. I don't know what it's like in Israel, but I know what it's like in America. But a person's own idea of God and his attributes may actually be used to justify and rationalize a different a deliberate neglect of their duty. Jonah tried to excuse his disobedience to God by saying, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God. This is what Jonah said. You know what he did after he got spit out in the ocean, got, then he got 
swallowed by the whale and then it got spit back up on the land. <laughs> I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. Jonah 4 and verse 2. Jonah played on a certain aspect of God's attributes, mercy, but neglected the other attributes and aspects of God wherein if he truly loved God, he would want to do the bidding of God without rationalizing his situation. And that's the way many people are. Even believers in Christ today don't seem to get it or comprehend what is right from what is wrong. I call it the getting ready to get ready syndrome. The divine standard of God is an option for a lot of folks. We can make what we want to be right when we want our way bad enough and what God thinks is foreign to us. Talking, And what I'm bringing these things out is that I want us to see examples of how mankind has expressed his righteousness versus the righteousness of God. Jonah expressed his type of righteousness versus the righteousness of God. People, when they reject their conscience of right and wrong, they are expressing their righteousness versus the righteousness of God. Human righteousness is another term for human good. This is one of the things that God told Adam and Eve to stay away. And particularly He told Adam, who was the head of that household, that you're not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The word there for good does not mean divine good. God was the divine good. That good was human good. Comparing His righteousness with the righteousness of God. So he felt that God would condemn him, though God didn't tell him he condemned him for being naked. He put on fig leaves or something to clothe himself because God wasn't ashamed of his nakedness. He made him naked. God didn't make Adam and then go to the Sears and Roebuck catalog and order a suit for him. But Adam in his human good says, this is shameful. God didn't say it was. And so often we try to say that things are shameful that God doesn't say that's shameful. Now, we cover up now because some people don't because and then the less they cover up, the more shameful they are. I, that's true, but God didn't go to the Sears and Roebuck and get an order of a set of Levi's for Adam and a little road dress for Eve or whatever. I don't know. But we can make what we want to be right when we want our way bad enough and what God thinks then becomes foreign to us. God is irrelevant today when it comes to our thought life. God tells a mother and father how to raise their children. God tells a man and a woman what the order should be in their home. People are saying, I don't think so. And there's too many Christians that say, I don't think so. Do you realize how much rebellion there is in Christian homes today? Because we don't think God knows what He's talking about. And we are afraid of our government. That's how bad our government's gotten. People are afraid to biblically, not abuse, but correct their children. The Bible says, spare not for their crime. They surely shall not die. We've gotten so soft here in America, I don't see how in the world we could ever defend ourselves against a foreign aggressor. Ridiculous. I see kids today when I go to the mall and they don't have arms bigger than pencils. They couldn't even pick up an M16. Much less wear a steel pot. They got the necks about that wide. That thing of Bob, it's like little bobbleheads. <laughs> or they're so chubby, there's no way they could do a pull up or sit up. They haven't seen their feet in years. Bellies are so big. It's ridiculous. Lazy, slobbing people. Easy to take. God is irrelevant today when it comes to our thought life. This is because people don't know the Bible at all, and much of what they see on TV and society, it's corrupting their morals. The divine standard of God expressed through the Scripture is looked at as an option, even to the Christian. In the book of Judges 21-25, it is said that every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. God's say on what is right and what is wrong is optional again to a lot of people. A free society is a decent society. Many of the things, if you look up what are the most uh, poverous, most poor, uh, corrupt, and um, unhealthy <coughs> societies in the world, the ten that are the most corrupt and the most unhealthy and uh, the weakest 
as I, I even looked at it this morning, of societies in the world, and again, 90% of it is in Africa. 90% of it is in Africa. Is that those people have such heathen beliefs and practices, and God has judged their, their nations. They have such corrupt leadership because those corrupt leaders come out from the bellies of corrupt families who don't bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. If you don't bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, don't expect them to respect the Lord when they get older. Thank God there are those who come out from that, but they are very few and far between. But I'm talking about the foundational structure of a nation. Whether you got Christian or non-Christian, you should respect one another. A free society is a decent society where people can simultaneously do good and do well for themselves and each other. Irregardless, or regardless, irregardless is not a word, regardless of whether or not you're a Christian, you can still live a, as a decent person. For some, morality is a cloak that the activists put on when it suits them. The view of Western immorality, the view of Western immorality, that's us. Everyone else of that way, Mediterranean on us, Eastern culture, Eastern world, we're considered Western culture, okay? The view of Western immorality is termed, and I'll, this is in quotations, the first atheistic civilization in the history of humankind. See, we are considered a civilization that has become atheistic. And it's, it is because our actions say we are. Our actions view as a nation, that's what we are. And the West, freedom has become another word for licentiousness. Remember the, all the weirdness in the 60s and early 70s, and now it's come again. And it's starting to come to fruition and bloom because those people are now the professors in the universities. They're the ones that are proposing that it's all right if an uncle uh, has relations with his nieces and nephews. The palimony is just fine. That's group marriage. They're the ones that are promoting it. Well, those are the children who were raised in that hippie world back in the day. This is the way the rest of the world views America. <clears throat> Freedom has become another word for licentiousness and our sense of responsibility to God and society has grown dimmer. The West used to be Christian. Now it is pagan. This is from the newspaper called The Reflector. If you ever want to look that up, it's a pretty good conservative paper called The Reflector. Moral uh, perpetuity is, is, is highlighted in this. The West used to be Christian. Now it is considered pagan. Hollywood, all the things that goes on, the underseed, the dirty underbelly of our nation, that's what it's become. Because we have assumed that the righteousness of God is not for us. I'm not saying the church, though the church has been infiltrated by such, but that's the way we're viewed. What God's Word says carries little to no weight. You know that's true. These people in Congress and many of our lawmakers and judges, many of our professors and the leaders in these, our nation have no respect for God. They don't appreciate the righteousness of God. Sad to say, a lot of Christians see what the righteousness of God as something as to which they will never attain. Let me say something. When you get saved, the righteousness of God is implanted in your account, in your soul. You are imputed. The righteousness of God is imputed to you. You didn't earn it. You don't work to get it. You don't work to keep it. It is something that God puts you into. You are in a state of righteousness. You will remain in that state of righteousness. Within that state of righteousness, you will sometimes be in fellowship, sometimes out of fellowship but you will stay in that state or that position. Your practices will wane at times and then you will be real good and faithful at times. God knew that when He saved you that you weren't going to be perfect. But you must never forget what state you're in. You must never forget your position in the body of Christ. Regardless if you feel like you're a good Christian that day or not. 
You're not what you are because of what you do. You are what you are because of what He did. You're saved because He keeps you. You're not saved because you work to keep yourself. You're not saved because you feel like you're saved. You're saved because you believe in Jesus and from thence God says, you're mine. You're saved because I say you're saved. You don't say you're not saved because you say you're saved. You're saved because God says you're saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. God said that. God's the one that said that. You believe and you receive Him. If we are saved, we already have the righteousness of God in us, and God will fill us eventually with those righteous standards. God will release those righteous standards in you. The seed is there. It's not going anywhere, okay? But you need to grow in the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, you need to grow in the faith. Faith comes by the hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Not the Word of the band, but the Word of God. Faith does not come by people telling you when you do your good works, oh, she's a great person, he's a great person. And you kind of get a little lifted up and feel a little good about that. Faith doesn't come by that. Faith comes through the hearing and the hearing of the Word of God. It's a different realm. When in truth, we, are, we already have the righteousness of God in us by faith in Christ. And then eventually God will fill us with His righteous standards as we receive His Word, then He releases that faith into us. And He opens that seed pot up more. Just think about it. Open it up more. It's there now. And it needs to be fed the milk of the Word. If you say that you are born again, but you have no desire for the milk of the Word of God, you are not saved. And if you're listening to me today online or whatever, and you say that I was a child or this or that or the other, and I had, and I told Mama, or I told Daddy, or I told Grandma that I was believing on Jesus for my salvation. But I never had any taste for the Word of God. I really didn't know what I was believing. And I think many don't know what they were believing. But I will tell you, if you ever got saved, the Holy Spirit will awaken you, will not let you sleep for the next 20, 30, 40 years and be dormant. That brings no glory to God. The Holy Spirit will awaken you and say, all right, it's time now you come aware of the fact that you're saved, that you understand that, and that you need to suckle the milk of God's Word. Because if you don't grow back, God's not going to let you, let you down the vine. So once you accept Christ as Savior, you're going to have a desire, as First Peter says, for the sincere milk of the Word of God. Chapter 2. So then we just need to adhere to God's standards and stick to them. The Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 16 to 7 10 tell us, excuse me, the Corinthians, as per 2 Corinthians 11 4, they listened to another gospel. That was a terrible thing to happen. They shouldn't have done that. The righteousness of God came to us, to the world, through Jesus Christ and none other. And that's the way it's supposed to be. The Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, they listened to another gospel. I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4. We've already talked through this book and the other book of Corinthians. But 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 4, uh, Paul said, because he had to go back to them to talk to them, because they had heard the gospel of the righteousness of God in Christ and had come to salvation. Not all of them, but many had, and they had a church there where they would meet for worship. He said, verse 1, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, because they were so carnal, as per chapter 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 3. They were so carnal, they were even having a relationship with their own family members. But they were brought up in that pagan mindset, and they were led to believe that, you know, what what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Well, no, not with God. For I am jealous over you, verse 2, with a godly jealous, for I have espoused you to one husband, that is to Christ, that I may present you as a, as a pure, chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted, your minds, should be corrupted from the simplicity, the single-mindedness, 
that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, Allah there, means a different version of Jesus, not a different kind, but a different version of who Jesus is described in the Scripture. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, because he is the righteousness of God, he is God in the flesh, or if you have received another spirit, which you have not received, that is through our preaching, or another good news, which you have not accepted, because you accepted originally the good news, but now they're telling you there's another gospel that you can live in all and God doesn't care. That you can do whatever you want to do and God doesn't care. God does care if you are a Christian and you're living a licentious life. God does care if you're a Christian and all you do is gossip. God does care if you're a Christian and you're a thief. God does care. His righteousness does not approve of it. And what the righteousness of God does not approve, the justice of God does not approve. And when the righteousness of God says to discipline somebody for their ungodly living, the justice of God sees to it. The justice of God is the watchdog of God. The justice of God is the watchdog of God. And what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God does carry out. It's not about protecting your feelings. It's about protecting the integrity of God. Again, we are clay. We are dirt. We are animated dust is all we are. We like to think we're all that in a bag of chips. We're just a bag. Oh my word. Look down verse 13 of that same chapter. For such, that is, he teach these false teachers. And there are a lot of cults that teach false teachings. A lot of religions that teach false teachings. The Bible says that these are false apostles. Apostles once sent out with a message. These are false apostles. These are deceitful workers. They spin the Word of God to be something that it's not. They make Jesus and what God expects of humanity to be something that the Bible doesn't say. They are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. As someone I've seen on Facebook recently said, as the wolf is talking to the sheep, that's all right. When you elect me to be in office, I'll become a vegetarian. <laughs> and no marvel for Satan himself will morph himself into an angel like he did that in the Garden of Eden when he tempted Eve telling her that if she ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that she surely would not die. That she would be like God knowing both good and evil. She would know it all. Lied. They morph themselves into angels of light. They wear all their clerical garb. The Nicolaitan garb as I call it. They have all their mantras and things that they do. All the little smoke and mirrors that they try to, to lay out there as if they're doing something that's holy. That's all a ruse. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, people he inspires to think that they're better than God and God's Word. It's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So that gospel, that good news to the Corinthians allowed them to live in a state of immorality. They felt all right. That's why so many people don't want a church that says anything about sin because they don't want it, they don't want it brought up. Any kind of sin. Well, you can't walk right before God and I can't walk right before God if I'm walking in sin. I'm not going to be happy with it and I'm not going to let God deal with it in me. So a lot of people are just determined they're not going to let God deal with the sin in their life. They're just not going to let it happen. Hey, you can go tell me what I'm going to do. Paul said this is not the gospel of Christ Jesus. It's, the, it's a gospel of righteousness. Jesus Christ is God's answer to the problem of sin. He's God's answer to the problem of sin. Not religion, not morality. The answer to our sin is not reformation, but regeneration. Regeneration, palin's in it. The, uh, means pos for palin. Is, means all, Genesis or Genesis beginning. It's a new beginning. It's all beginning new. And when you get saved, it's regeneration. Titus uh, 3 and verse 5. 
Christ came to rid us of sin. He didn't come to tolerate it. And He rids us of it positionally, but we still trek back into our old habits from time to time, whether it's mental attitude sins, verbal sins, sins of the flesh. It can happen. And we pay the price for it, but we don't pay, we're not abandoned because of it. We abandon Him doesn't mean He abandons us. If your kids abandon you, don't you abandon them. If anything, they at least need to see at least the example that God would give to them were they to be His children. God does not overlook sin. Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the satisfactory payment to remove our sin. He was set forth to declare the righteousness of God and reconcile us to God. Last couple of items and we're done. Love could not save us alone. Justice had to be satisfied. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. You can put Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 11 in that section right there. He offered His soul a sacrifice for mankind in Isaiah chapter 53 it says. God was satisfied he was pleased with the sacrifice. And I want us to understand something. This never was a time in eternity past before Christ came that He didn't know that this was going to be His lot for those 33 years. He always knew it. But when He came, He had to come and, le and learn it through His humanity. And that is a hard thing for some people to wrap their mind around is the humanity of Christ as He became more and more as a boy and then a teenager cognizant of what his real purpose in life was. Love could not save us alone. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, not in the living Jesus who was unfortunately murdered, but in the crucified Jesus. Crucified for what? Our sins. So it's not just that you're believing in Jesus because He was a great example. You're believing in Jesus Christ because He's the Son of God who came and took away your sins as a sacrifice unto God. Because your sins separate you from God and until you are joined back to God, you are going to die and go to hell. You're not going to heaven. Adam died spiritually as soon as he sinned and God told him he would according to Genesis 2 and verse 17. He died spiritually as soon as he sinned. And this spiritual death, according to Romans 5.12, is passed on through all of mankind. And there's some other verses you can put right along with that. The Bible speaks of the second death. That's eternal separation from God. And that's why Jesus says you have to be born again. You're born again once physically, but you need to be born again spiritually because you're born spiritually dead. You're born physically alive, but you're born spiritually dead. You must be born again. This born again command refers to spiritual new birth. Spiritual new birth is not something that you produce. It's something that you receive when you accept Christ as Savior. He's the only righteous sacrifice acceptable to God. Because He's the only sinless person ever to live. <laughs> to be born to the human race. <coughs> The righteousness of God accepts no substitutes including works of any kind or of any amount. If Mary were to be born, had to have been born sinless to be a co-sotair or co-savior with Christ, then that means that her daddy did not have a sin nature either. Which means his daddy would not have had a sin nature. Which means his daddy, all the way back to Adam, could not have had a sin nature. Which makes God's truth about us all being sinners a lie. The Catholic Church makes a liar when it says that Jesus, that Mary is a co-regent with Jesus Christ. Because for her to be sinless, that means that her mother did not have... She had to be immaculately conceived too. Jesus was, but Mary wasn't. That's not scriptural. That's Babylonian priesthood theology. That is not biblical theology. So I just want to throw that up there free of charge. There's no one that was sinless except for Jesus Christ. People can tell you everything you know. The more you know the Bible, the more you know how much other people are lying. If you want to check out what a counterfeit is, you've got to know the real 
denomination. You've got to know what a real 20 looks like. You've got to know everything about that bill. You've got to know everything about it. The more you know about it, the less you've got to study these other people because as soon as they show up, you can pick them out because you know that watermark should not be there. That should not be there. That's not what the real plates look like. That's why those people who are good at that have studied the plates and that's why they have to keep changing them. You know the current plate. That's why we've got to stay up with the Bible. Because the world is finding more and more ways to mask what they think Christianity is, is because of deceiving us. Let's, let's pray and we got to close here. Alright. I'll try to do the next one a little slower. Father, thank you for this day and for your blessing. Thank you for your kindness and love to us. Thank you now for this day of grace and for what your righteousness provides for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.